Oh. Good evening. Good evening. All right, we're uh, going to be starting chapter 11, but really part two. But um, Dion, would you say an opening prayer for us? Our Father God, we thank you for providing us with this time to study your word, to come to a better understanding of your word, and we pray that you bless us in this endeavor as we are ready listeners to your word. We also pray that you be with our teacher of this evening, that he have a ready recollection of the things that he's prepared, that he'll be able to state them very clearly so that we all can understand. We pray that you continue to be with us and forgive us of our sins. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for praying that I remember what I studied because it was two weeks ago. <laughs> Another reason for you not to be able to go away. <laughs> exactly. All right. So um, last night I went ahead and did something you're not supposed to do. I watched my lesson from two weeks ago so that I could remember where I left off. And I want to commend you guys in your participation in the class and answering and and just your general level of, of involvement. It, uh, I'm very happy that you guys are involved and I'm not just sitting up here talking for an hour. <laughs> Otherwise that's not gonna go well. So keep it up, especially you, Carol. <laughs> I told them I was gonna be quiet. <laughs> oh, you did, okay. All right, so <clears throat> the key events in chapter 11 were Peter's defend, uh, defense going to the Gentiles, which we have already talked about. The church in Antioch, and then disciples first called Christians. So I'll do a quick review. I'm just going to do Peter's defense, and it's just going to be pictures. So remember, Peter's in Jerusalem. He went to Lydia. He went to Joppa, Arjopa, uh, then to Caesarea. We saw the Holy Spirit descend on uh, Cornelius' family. And by the time he got back to Jerusalem, word had spread. Peter, you ate with the uncircumcised. Peter explained his vision, gave his defense, and said, who was I to stop God? It was obviously God's will that this was happening. <clears throat> so they quieted down and glorified God. Then we had just started Barnabas. So we'll start there again. It says, so then, and remember this so then is going back and he's telling us something that happened in the past. And that was those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews alone. That's what happened in the past. And I showed you where Antioch and Phoenicia and Cyprus were. And then, but there were some of them. And I believe that this, the first part happened right after Stephen's uh, stoning. This part is happening later. Um, like I said, again, Luke isn't interested in giving us perfect times and things, but we know that this happened after Peter already uh, went to Cornelius. And this could be quite some time. Some people put this, I put the Cornelius thing at about 41 AD. So about 10 years after Pentecost. Some people put this as another five years farther than that. So this could be happening anytime from 10 to 15 years in the timeline. Five years seems a bit much to me. I think this happened a while after Cornelius uh, happened. After what? After the conversion of Cornelius and his and his uh, family, extended family. So, but those, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks, also preaching the Lord Jesus. So again, I, I this is about where we end. I showed you the, the map of, of the places these men came from. 
which is interesting. They're some of the same places that the men that stoned Stephen came from. So um, I, no connection between the two events. It's just interesting that it seemed to be Hellenistic Jews from outside Jerusalem that were doing some of these things. Um, I believe these men just went straight up to Antioch after the persecution. They may have been from Cyrene, but I don't think they went home and then went to Antioch. That doesn't make a lot of sense. <clears throat> and then we talk about this important part. And the hand of the Lord was with them. What is that telling us? Chuck. You're doing God's will. Then preaching to Gentiles, God was with that. So they're exactly right. They're doing the will of God there. We're seeing what we talked about earlier. The message that Jesus said will be given to all nations is starting that process of being given, being given to all nations. And the result was a large number who believed turned to the Lord. This is, uh, yeah, this was the Jews that were from other places, went to Antioch, and they were teaching Greeks, or the Greeks speaking. They could be, they were probably a lot of Romans there, uh, Greeks. It, we're going to look at the city in a minute, and it's a cosmopolitan. But a great number of believers. Yeah, but a, but a great number of non-Jews are starting to hear and be converted to the church. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. And I think this was like the last thing we showed. Um, these are some of the places Barnabas goes. He goes to Antioch, he goes to Cyprus, he goes to Tarsus. Um, That they, they heard that the hand of the Lord was with them in Antioch. That's where they heard. Yes. Yep. The hand of the Lord was with them. Uh, the news that reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas off. Again, we have that the news is slowly traveling through someplace and they're reacting. And why didn't the Holy Spirit just send Barnabas? What was the question? The question is, they're reacting to news they heard by ear. Uh, and it makes me wonder if, and I believe this is a God-sanctioned thing that's going on. Why wasn't Barnabas sent up there by the by the work of the Holy Spirit. And I, I'm not looking for an answer. I don't know what the answer is, Wilson. AKA, better encouragement. Maybe he's going up to encourage people to confirm what the Bible says. Well, that's why he's going up. I'm wondering why the Spirit didn't send him up. Why did he wait till the men in Jerusalem heard about it and goes up? Well, I'm reading verse 23, and uh, he was like celebrating because he says he witnessed the grace of God. Yeah, to that's when he gets Gentiles. when he gets there. And yeah, why he didn't send him to open? And I don't know. We have an answer. Um, it just kind of points out that they heard it in Jerusalem. So I think sometimes, and I know, I know people think this about the writing of the, of the Bible itself that every single word we say is God inspired. Did the Holy Spirit take over it and? Have them write every word. No, each author has their own style. So uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't just take over these people and make them robots. And so sometimes I wonder how much direction they had from the Holy Spirit. Now I say that at the same time, I know that we see Paul at one point want to go into Macedonia and the Spirit stops him. So there's... This level of interaction I, I, that I, I don't have knowledge of. of well, what they were encouraged. Um, says here they were encouraged. With the purpose of heart that they should continue with the Lord. So they, they, 
the apostles and disciples and the call. They saw that. Yeah. I see what you're saying is this um, to encourage them with all with resolute heart. It's like, and then he, he talks of the testimony of who Barnabas is. He was a yeah. good man. And we don't hear the Bible talking about specific, a lot of specific men saying he was a good man. Yeah. So let's look at, at that. It says, then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God. And what is the grace of God that Barnabas is witnessing in Antioch? That the Gentiles were going to. Is it just the Gentiles? Yeah, all, of all of them. I, I think it's. Thanks Kathy? God, they were trying to uh, the gospel. They were yeah, I think. And being added to the church. I think it was just the progress that that church had made in Antioch. Uh, both Gentile and Jew. He goes there and he sees a growing work, and he's he gives the grace. He gives the grace to God. You know, he gives the credit to God. Um, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. So Barnabas, the encourager, what is the first thing he does? He encourages them. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. So he gets there. Even more people are being added to the church. So, and we're going to look at this in a, in a moment, uh, why this is so important why it's more important than we probably uh, give it credit. And the next verse says, and he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Why, why would he leave and go with him? Why would he leave and go get uh, Saul? That's a good question. Um, first, let me show you where um, here they are in Antioch, Syria, or Syria, Antioch. And it's only about 50 miles away if you could take a plane, but it's about 143 miles by foot. So Barnabas is going a great distance to bring Paul back. He came and him back from Tarsus, right? Yeah, he went to Tarsus, and then he brought him back. So it's 143 miles both ways, walking. I'm assuming walking. He didn't say he'd take a boat or anything like that. Well, it's a long, a long trip. Paul had gone back to Tarsus, though, because that's where he was from. Yes. Paul had been in Tarsus for many years, as a matter of fact. He was probably there seven or eight years. And he... Probably did a lot of teaching there. We would assume so. Um, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to we're going to look at all these questions. Let's look at first. Why was Barnabas sent to Antioch? Just to see what was going on with the, with the people there. Yeah. He went to look for Saul. No, Antioch, not Tarsus yet. Oh, I thought you said Tarsus. No, no, why was he sent to Antioch? Why did the Jerusalem church send Barnabas to Antioch? What was the purpose? Well, they need encouragement, and that's what he gave them. Yeah. Um, help, help teach the, the newborn Christian. And that's what he did. He encouraged him and taught him. Kathy, what? Well, they were growing by numbers, so. Yeah. Sure they needed. And didn't they were hoping that he could help set up the church? I, you know, I don't know what their hope was. Was he sent there to? What's purpose of heart? What was that? Your purpose. That's what, what they needed Paul for, right? To help. Yeah, and but I'm trying to figure out why did the church in Jerusalem send Barnabas there? Now, I can think of a, a reason why they might have sent other people. They might have sent some of the apostles if they wanted to pass on the gifts. But Barnabas doesn't, as far as we know, doesn't have that. So are they sending Barnabas because 
they're heard that Gentiles are being preached to, and is he going to go check it out? Or are they sending Barnabas there for what Barnabas ended up doing, encouraging them, helping establish the church? was already there, obviously, because he saw it growing. So, again, it's one of those things we're not given a, a, a quen- an answer to. It would make more sense that they had sent an apostle. But some of the reasons might be that Barnabas was from Cyprus. And he was used to dealing with those kind of people that would have been in Antioch. So all the other ones were Jews and maybe didn't even speak Greek without the help of the Holy Spirit. And yet when we see the Holy Spirit, it's, it's to glorify God. I don't know if they can use it daily speech to do translation uh, like Google or something like that. But <clears throat> Barnabas might have been the best fit. Well, when he saw the grace of God, he was glad. So apparently there was something there they wanted him to see. Yeah, but they don't know. I mean, they're, it's like an, they're sending him off exploratory. They don't know what he's going to find there. They just hear. Well, I'm sure they, they all talk. You were just saying the news travels fast there. No, it doesn't travel past. It travels they slow. Don't they don't talk to each other. It's 300 miles away by foot. So, um, so we're going to go back to Barnabas going for, tar- uh, for Paul in a minute. Um, I want to actually take this opportunity to talk about uh, the city. Remember, I showed you this slide this time last this last time. This is um, the city of Tarsus. I'm not going to cover that this week, but just a few things. The city of Tarsus has been around for a long time. Actually, actually, they use the term prehistoric. What does that mean? Does that mean Flintstones and stuff? Before recorded history. Before recorded history. So they have they have ruins going back there before man started writing stuff down. Unlike Antioch, which we know was established in 300 BC. So Tarsus is a long occupied place. Paul grew up there. Um, we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll study it a lot more later. It's were they, were they a lot of Jews there? Because he was raised. He was, there were Jews in most major cities throughout the Roman Empire. He, it's a college town. It's got the second best college after Alexandria. Um, Paul was raised there up until a certain time. Then he went to Jerusalem and was raised there. It was a Roman city. So if you live there, were born there, you had citizenship. And that will be important. We'll see that later. But the real thing we wanted to talk about was the city of Syria, Antioch. Okay. It's also called Antioch on the Orontes. That's the river that uh, you see the city on. It was founded. Well, we'll get to that slide. If you can see, there was like a little island and these walls here, you see these outlines. The Romans actually built walls to protect the area. It was an important city. And uh, here you can see like a modern day Google view of the area. They haven't built too much on the old ruins. Um, the, the main city is bigger. Now here, here's the interesting thing. The modern city, the old city, you go back and look how small the old city was. It's this little part here. The big city covers much more territory, but actually has less population than the little city did. Um, the little city's population was anywhere from 250,000 to 500,000 people. That was a little city? <laughs> yeah. I, I say little size-wise compared to the modern city. The... Uh, it was known as the Queen of the East. Well, why did it have that title? Um, it was the capital of the province of Syria. It was founded by Seleucius I in 300 BC. 
Who is Seleucius? That whole area is named after him. He's one of the generals from Alexander the Great. So when the kingdom was divided up after Alexander fell, he got this section and built this city. And he built another city. The river Theron is 20 miles from the Mediterranean. He built another city on the Mediterranean there that's a port. That's the port for Antioch. Um, Chuck, can you let them in? Hmm? Let them sit in. The uh, just to get past you. The we say Antioch, and we know that there's several Antiochs. Well, there's really he built seventeen Antiochs. Two became very popular. His that was his both his father's name Antiochus and his son's name. So they don't know which ones were built for the father and which ones were built for the son, but he built 17. We later see uh, Paul go to Antiochus, uh, Pisca, I think it is. Um, so he built a lot of them. This one became quite large. It was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. So in our mind, Antioch, oh, there's that's where the first come Christians, a little place. No, it's the third biggest city in the world only behind Rome and Alexandria. Well, Athens is in there. Yeah. Nope. It's well, actually, the city that you're talking about, they built an empire. Yes, he did. He and, and Right, I got cut off when that happened. Had he not died early, they think he's the one general that could have reunited all of Alexander's things under him, but then he died uh, too early before it, it came off. Is that you're talking about? Seleucius the first, the, the, the one who, who built it in 300 BC. Okay, so he was a general. Yes, he was one of Alexander's generals. Okay. Um, there's a point where it had over half a million people living there. It had been conferred to be its own freedom, but in 70 or 47 BC, Julius Caesar ever, even went and visited and reconfirmed that it was a free city. So you were born there. You had all the rights of a Roman citizen and everything. It was a junction of the trade routes between the east and the west. And I thought I put a slide in here, but I must have put it farther back. Um, it was a main center of Hellenistic Judaism. When this city was founded, he encouraged Jews to come settle his city in 300 B.C., and gave them full citizenship. It's interesting when um, they were given full status from the beginning, and it says Jews retained most freedoms after the Jews revolt. In 70 AD, when the Jews revolted, a bunch of the people there wanted to kick the Jews out and take their rights away. And the rulers said, there, said no, they get to stay. Um, and they said, well, let us at least destroy the copper. that They had a big copper plate where the rights of the Jews were chiseled on. Let's say, destroy the copper plate at least. No, you can't do that. But what he let them do was to start to interfere with them, make them work on Saturday, or uh, provoke them to bow down to idols. So the Jews started being persecuted after the destruction of Rome in that area. Um, it's the chief center of early Christianity here in Roman times. We think of Jerusalem as always being the center. But within a few years, Antioch is the chief place that Christianity spreads from. Where do all the missions come from? From Antioch. Um, this is the hub. It's a cosmopolitan place. All trade from that area goes through it. It's got a huge population, a large Jewish content, like over 10% Judaism, uh, Jewish people living in the in the city at that time. So it had a, a huge effect on Christianity. We we if people if you just ask people, they say oh, it's Jerusalem and then it was Rome. Uh, but that's not true. Antioch was the center of Christianity for quite a while. Uh, 
until until about I think 300 when the Roman Empire approved of Christianity and then it, it got settled in Rome. Up until that point, Antioch was the, the center of Christianity. Um, the city has a long history after that. It was it was used as the main city by the Crusades when all the European nations came back and tried to take the promised land back. They took over Antioch and that was their area And because it had been going back and forth between hands. Um, but in 1268, the Barbers besieged the city Antioch. And they talked to the people and the people said, okay, we'll let you have the city as long as you don't kill us. And they said, okay. And then they didn't keep their word. The Muslim troops started to plunder, kill, and take prisoners. Every man in the city was put to the sword. They plundered the place for three days. They said there was 17,000 Christians were slaughtered and 100,000 dragged away into slavery. So they about wiped this place out. And it changed hands back and forth a few times. But eventually, a historian goes in there in the late 1400s, and there's about 30 houses with people. That's all that's left there. 30 houses of people. So 30 homes. That's it. Almost nothing compared to the half million it had before. Now, it's in Turkey. That's the country of Turkey currently. And they obviously built another city right there. And it's sort of the same name, but... During the, uh, I talked about the Crusades. During the Crusades, the, the Crusades had taken back different areas. And uh, like Antioch was the place that they used to do a lot of these raids until they got to Jerusalem. Uh, the crossroads, I want to show you this interesting road. The place was so big and popular because it was at the cross of two of the major trade routes in the world. One was called the Royal Road, which was built uh, by the Persians. And it went from down here up right through Antioch and into Greece. Now, the Silk Road came from here up to here, and it went up into this corner, and then went all the way to China, way over here. <laughs> to China, the Silk Road. So these were both major trade routes, and they both went right through where Antioch was. So when he placed that city there, he knew what he was doing, and it became a huge city. Um, I just think it's interesting that, uh, I mean, even I didn't realize, even after teaching the class the first time, how big Antioch was until I decided to look at Antioch. Uh, some other things, Roman free cities, they... Um, they have self-governing. In other words, they don't have to be directed directly by Roman. They're free from uh, paying taxes and tributes. They have the right of those who live in Italy, and they own land. Uh, they're exempt from scourging without uh, through courts. Freedom from unlawful arrest. Right of appeal to the emperor, which we see Paul use, and exempt from cruc uh, crucifixion, which is why. In the church fathers, Peter's crucified, but Paul is beheaded because Paul was a Roman citizen and wasn't allowed to be crucified. Um, like I said, again, that's according to the church fathers. A few pictures from the area. This is a Roman road that went through that area. And it's surprisingly, after 2,000 years, better shaped than some of the roads around my house. <laughs> this is called... Peter's Grotto. Um, legend has it that this was the area where Peter would teach from. That's like the little place and it goes up and you could talk from there. Um, they built a church there and it got burned down. They did, but throughout the years, this one place was designated him. If it's true, I don't know. What they did find when they, in the 1930s, they started trying to excavate it, but they couldn't find a lot of the, uh, the big buildings they were looked for 
And since then, turkeys come in and, and when they want to build something new, they just bulldoze her over the ruins. They don't care. But in 1930, they found a lot of uh, mosaics. I mean, like hundreds of them. And they, and they went to different museums and stuff. I thought this one was an interesting one. This one was, the words there say, be cheerful, enjoy your life. It's called the reckless skeleton. <laughs> and it's almost, the, it's almost like the proverb, you know, uh, uh, eat, drink, and be merry. But uh, go back to the map. So like I said, 20 miles down here, the port. Barnabas shows up. Oh, let me show you another picture here. This picture from 16, this drawing from 1699 shows what ruins there were left at that time of the walls that the Romans had built around. Now, I, I heard, but I couldn't find any pictures that some of these on the mountainside are still there, but everything else has been gone. So this was uh, painted in 1699. This was left of the wall. Yeah. And this is what uh, the town had grown to in, in 1699. So it's just still just a little thing so anyways that gives you some historical significance of what antioch is like and and how they become the center to send out all these to send paul out on all these missions the news about them reached the ears of the church and, and they sent barnabas off um, so we go back to the question why was barnabas sent to antioch I think he was just the best fit. Um, I'm surprised that it, that a apostle didn't go to pass on the gifts. That, but maybe they didn't feel comfortable. Um, but what they heard was good news, wasn't it? Was it? They heard it. Yeah, basically, yeah. We saw that considerable numbers <clears throat> were brought to the Lord, and John puts in the question here, in verse 24 it states, considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. Why? Why were considerable numbers brought to the Lord? Well, uh, Barnabas was full of the Holy Spirit, and he was probably speaking with authority, and who knows? And even, even before that they were already bringing considerable numbers even before Barnabas got there. The Jews started uh, bringing the gospel, preaching the gospel to the yeah. people, didn't they? Remember, John wrote these questions. <laughs> but you hear that? What did you say? John wrote this question. Oh. So he has a follow up question, and I think you'll know where I'm going. Mm -hmm. What can we learn from this example that we can apply today? Mm -hmm. So the reason there were considerable numbers is because they were out preaching the word. In season, out of season, right? And the hand of the Lord was with them. And the hand of the Lord was with them. So when you have the Lord behind you, and even if you're in circumstances that seem insurmountable, who can stand against the Lord? Well, it reminded of Joshua when Moses passed away. He was like, I have to go over to the cross of Cross that river or that sea, wherever that do, and he has conquered it. Can and he did? Yeah. But God had to encourage him. Yep. When, uh, like I said, that the most important verse on I think was, and God was with them. You know. Well, they were first called Christians there too. Yes, they were. Okay. You're reading one verse ahead of me again. That was important. <laughs> that was important. <laughs> And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with considerable with uh, met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Who did Barnabas look for to help at Antioch? Paul. Was it Paul? Yes, yeah, Saul. 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 It's Saul. Same difference, really. I'm just being. Why? Why did he go get Saul? Why would he 
walk 150 miles one way and 150 miles back and have to find Saul. What was Saul doing all this time for seven, eight, nine, ten years since he's been heard from? Teaching. We don't have any record of what he's doing. What do we suppose he was doing? We know Paul. What do we suppose he was doing? He was preaching yeah, to the Jews and synagogues. Yeah, that's what we assume he's doing. It's after he was converted. And after he's converted. He's done all that good. Would his family have accepted him or probably rejected him? Well, it's hard to say. I guess it depends on whether he converted them or not, right? But he's a he's with the family of Pharisee of Pharisees. If he came back, he was probably not accepted when he moved back to Tarsus. Well, he'd been causing before he became Christian. He was really being mean to Christians. Yeah, but this is in Tarsus. There won't be any Christians in Tarsus no, yet at this point. His family, though, maybe some of those were. Yeah. So. Why did Barnabas go look for this? I, I mean, I know that Barnabas was on Saul's side when he came and visited Jerusalem. So he's up there. Uh, maybe he needed help. When, let's look back at the past a little bit. It says, when Saul told the apostles and Barnabas in Jerusalem how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly in Damascus in, in the name of Jesus. He most likely included the Lord's declaration to Ananias that he saw that Saul was a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name to Gentile, before Gentiles. So if Paul, Saul had told Barnabas the story of, of getting his sight back, he would have mentioned that the Lord said, I'm going to be his vessel to the Gentiles. <clears throat> Barnabas goes up there. We're starting to teach the Gentiles. Who do I need to get? I need to go get that Saul guy. He's The Lord picked him to do this. So he goes to Antioch and brings him back. Uh, I guess that's the why. <laughs> uh, the disciples were first called uh, Christians uh, in Antioch. <coughs> And who do we believe gave them this name? Who called them in Christians? In other words, did they call themselves Christians or other people call them Christians? Was it a derogatory name? In the past, we've talked about that before. But sorry. Yeah. It seems like the Romans were the ones called them Christians, those Christians. And yeah, or little, little Christ. Mm -hmm. But I've been reading that, and I'm not sure it's right. Um, some people, again, we can't be definitive on this, but some people writing about this think that they call themselves Christians. Either way, whether it meant it was meant derogatory and did they come up with it or did they hear the Christians calling themselves that and then use it as a derogatory term? Either way, they, to this day, we still use that name. And we don't see it as derogatory, Brad. Well, obviously, this name was accepted from God. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'll give you a cross -turn. Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time, you were say, persuade me to be a Christian. So the name was known well enough that by the time he's defending himself, even Agrippa knows the term. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in his name. So whatever the reason how it got chosen, um, I agree with Brad, it was acceptable. And we use it to this day. So we're almost out of time. Let's see if we can get through these last couple of verses. Who's Agabus? Now, now, again, a time thing. So why is this in the same chapter? We don't know. At, at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. He was a prophet. Yeah, and more than one. So... Now, when 
Barnabas went and got Paul, Saul, Paul, these both at this point. What could Paul do that Barnabas couldn't do? Laying on the hands, he could pass the gifts. Um, still, we have some prophets that are traveling around, they coming down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit. So we're told by Luke here that what he's saying was a prophecy by the Spirit, that there would certainly be a great famine over all the world, and this took place in the reign of Claudius. And you know, last time I studied this, I knew the dates, and now it's been two weeks. I don't remember the exact dates. Uh, Claudius was only in there for like four years. Um, I think it was 41 to 45, but I'm not 100% sure. It's been two weeks. I've slept since then. Drove 2,000 miles. So that's gone. <laughs> uh, Indicated by spirit that there would be a great famine all over the world. And it, there was a famine. And it was in the, during the reign of Claudius. So we have historical backup for this. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. Now, the famine was going to be all over the place. Wouldn't they need to send relief to themselves? Why were they sending money to Jerusalem? Must have been uh, well. You were talking about the trade route and everything going through Antioch, so they must have been more affluent there and had more money. And they knew that the Christians in Judea were on the poor side. Exactly right. The the the, the Christian family in in Jerusalem. One remember when they first became Christians? What happened to them? They had all their possessions taken away. They were stripped of their houses. Probably lost jobs mistreated by the Jews, so they're a relatively poor congregation. Antioch, like you said, very affluent. So throughout Paul's travel, this isn't going to be the first time, throughout his uh, travels, he's collecting money to send to the people in, in Jerusalem. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. Um, what was the prophecy by Agabus? Famine. There's going to be a great famine. Yep. How did the Christians respond to the prophecy? Sending money. In a Christ-like manner, Sending right? Food by way of Barnabas and Saul. Yeah. Um, what were we reading this morning where if they, they had food, they, they ate it, and if they had extra, they shared it with other people who didn't. Our Christian lifestyle is supposed to be one of, of sharing and caring for others. And what a great example that without being, being asked, these people gather together money and send it to a place most of them have never been to take care of the Christians there. And I, I just think it's a, a great example. Anyways, we finished chapter 11. Next week, chapter 12, and then the midterm. <laughs> so you should read something in, in verse or in chapter 26 to about and we will next week I'm going to talk about Herod and the Herod family because there's so many Herods it's confusing so uh, during next week's lesson we'll be talking about Herod a little bit um, next week is the last chapter where we follow Peter around. And then we're going to start following Paul. Yep. Thank you. And Alan's going to lead us a couple songs. I believe they're on the board already. Let's start with number 696, 696, He Loves Me.
Show me so. I'm going to wait a minute. Everybody's opening their books now. <laughs> 696. Tell me so. Why did the Savior heaven leave and come to earth below? When men his grace would not receive, because he loved me so. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know. He gave himself to die for me, because he loves me so. Why did the Savior mark the way, and why temptation know? Why teach and toil and plead and pray? Because he loves me so. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know. He gave himself to die for me, because he loves me so. Why feel the garden's dreadful dross? Why through his trials go? Why suffer death upon the cross? Because he loves me so. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know. He gave himself to die for me. Because he loves me so. And our next song is number 81. Jesus, lover of my soul. No me. Jesus, lover of my soul. Let me to thy bosom fly. While the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is high, hide me, O oh my Savior, hide, till the storm of life is past, safe into the haven's guide, O oh, receive my soul at last. Other refuge have I none, hangs my helpless soul on thee. Leave me, leave me not alone, still support and comfort me. All my trust on thee is saved, all my help from thee I bring. Cover my defenseless head with the shadow of my feet. Plenteous grace with thee is found, grace to cover all my sin. Let the healing streams abound, make and keep me pure within. Thou of life the fountain art, freely let me take of thee. Spring thou up within my heart, rise to all eternity. I believe Michael has to, is it Michael? No, it's Brad, sorry. Yeah, it's me. 